Hello, this is Dean Radin, and I am on Your Superior Self. Hi, I'm Anita Morjani, and this is Your Superior Self. Hello, this is Dr. Raymond Moody, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, cultural creatives. I'm Bruce Lipton, and I'm here to join you with Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Paul Selig, and this is Your Superior Self. What's up, everybody? I'm Aubrey Marcus, and this is Your Superior Self. Gabrielle Stone, and this is your superior self. Gabrielle, I feel like I've known you my whole life. I just got done finishing your book. It's so weird how we do that, right? Like, especially when we pick up memoirs, and especially for me, who do I do a lot of interviews with people, and um, well, I don't get to read fascinating books like yourself. I think maybe one I did read. It was uh, Alex Benayan, The Third Door. I don't Ooh, know if you've read that. that out. I have not. It seems very not like obviously the, the story is very different, but the way that you read it and the way that you speak uh, is very similar to the way he does. And I was like, mm. um, I was like really taken back by one, your story and two, your ability to be authentic and super honest. Yeah, so. I I think memoirs are a special genre because like you said, when you finish reading them, you feel if they're written properly, you feel like you've gone on this journey with this person. Um, the sequel that I wrote to this book, I even say in the intro, like if you're reading this, you probably feel like we're best friends by now um, because it's so true. You really like are able to connect with me and go on this journey with me. And it's been a really wild experience to see people's reaction to that and how they feel connected to me now. It's been really special. Sure. I mean, um, the honesty in it though, right? Like, I mean, it, it is your story and you, I don't, I'm sure you left some parts out, but it, it seems like you didn't because like, you're really putting yourself out there. How, uh, intimidating was that for you? It was a bit intimidating. I, I honestly, there's not much that's left out of that. And if it is, it's like boring, insignificant stuff. Um, mm. and that's one of the reasons when I took it and shopped it to publishers, I took it to the big five and they were all like, it's too much. It's too in your face. We don't know if there's a wide enough audience, like all this bullshit. And, um, some of them were like interested, but wanted me to tone certain things down. And I was like, no, like if I wanted to write some like beautiful, you know, words strung together and poetic, you know, I could have done that, but I wanted this book to feel like you were sitting down and having a glass of wine with me and going on this crazy, like Netflix journey that I went on. Um, mm -hmm. So I wrote really like I was talking to whoever was reading it. Uh, when I decided I was going to publish this, I sent my mother the uh, the first draft in like its vomit form. And I will <laughs> never forget she walked in to the room I was in and said, oh, sweetheart, are you sure you don't want to change your name or take out one of the men you slept with? <laughs> and I was like, mom, you know, if I'm going to do this and put this out in a raw and authentic way, I have to include everything as it happened. People have to know, you know, and I think they're going to relate to like the realness of it. And, you know, lo and behold, they did. But yeah, I mean, of course, when you're putting your life out there in such a raw and vulnerable way, it's not, not nerve wracking. <laughs> well, yeah. Right. Like, I, I don't know. Like you, yeah, you definitely put some details in there that uh, your mom and you must have really like a really special relationship. We do. We, we definitely do. Not all mothers could probably read about their daughters going through some of the things I went through in that book. I do know that my stepdad put it down when I got to Amsterdam and he was like, nope, <laughs> not doing it. And I'm like, dad, can you just skip that part and like read the rest? Like it's a best selling book. Like, come on. And he's like, no, nah, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so eat, pray, FML is the title of this book and it's um, a bestseller, right? Um, how did your life change? And I know you're an actress, right? Following in your footsteps of your mom, um, who I love, but how did it, how did it change when this launched into the world? Um, it was really interesting how it happened because yes, I, I was working as an actress and had just started directing and producing. Um, but at that time in my life, I was like, this is my career. This is what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. Um, and then my personal life blew up into flames, which I'm sure we'll get into the, you know, the actual story of the book. Um, and I, I went on this life changing journey to Europe and it changed me as a human. Like I came from, came home from that trip, a completely different person in all of the best ways. And I wrote the book and 
it didn't really, it, it did well when I released it in 2019, but in 2020, when COVID hit, I got onto TikTok begrudgingly because I was like, all these are like kids dancing and what am I going to do on this app? Mm. And lo and behold, uh, I had a bunch of videos go viral and it was the best marketing tool that I've had since. Um, and so when the, the videos went viral and the book really took off, it totally changed my life in a myriad of different ways. Financially, I was able to buy a house, which in California is like nearly impossible. Yes. Um, and gave me the financial freedom to not have to take certain acting roles that, you know, I was just doing for a paycheck, uh, which was, I was so grateful for, but also it changed my life in, I now have this entirely different career. So I was now an author and had to get comfortable calling myself one um, that the books and the success of the books started my podcast, FML Talk. So it really like shifted my career in a really big way. Um, and the best way that it changed my life is the messages that I've gotten over the years and still, you know, get on a weekly basis from my readers who are thanking me for writing the book for whatever reason it spoke to them, like getting out of an abusive relationship or learning to love themselves or deciding they didn't want to be in the marriage that they were in. Um, so many heartwarming and touching messages from people whose lives have been changed by reading my story. And that's incredibly special. Mm -hmm. And the sequel is your life after the trip. Yeah. So eat, pray, FML goes from me finding out about my husband having an affair, um, and the relationship I got into after and the entire crazy journey I end up uh, going on in Europe. Uh, and it ends when I get on the plane to come home. So that's a complete like three month period of my life. If you can believe that all of that craziness happened <laughs> over a span of three months. Um, and the, the sequel, the ridiculous misadventures of a single girl is the day I get home from Europe. So right when I get off the plane, um, and two years of my life after that. And the sequel, I didn't know I was going to write. It happened after the book came out and everyone that finished it was like, what the fuck happened after Europe? Like, you can't just like not tell us. <laughs> um, and because it was my life, it ended up being a saga in itself. So um, I did the sequel and I think the sequel was actually harder for me to write than the first one. The first one like really just flowed out of me and it was almost like therapy for me. The second one, I was writing about people who were still currently in my life. Um, I had a relationship to protect at that point. Uh, it was it was a lot of very different emotions writing that book than the first one. Mm. Yeah, like the, the first one, it just seems like, yeah, like you said, to your point, flowing out of you. The second one, like you said, a little bit harder because now you have this, this book that is this bestseller, right? And where do you go from there? Right. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, one, one thing I do want you to do, right. And the, what I kept hearing in the book is how you had this quick timeline of like this, the, the, the cliff notes of your story. And I was very interested yeah. about that because your story is like very dynamic and it's, mm -hmm. and it's not something that you can easily spit out, but what is the, the cliff notes that I kept hearing about the in, the, in the book? <laughs> the cliff notes version of the story. Um, and this is when, when people, when I was on the trip solo traveling, you know, you meet so many people and they're always like, well, why are you on this trip? Cause there's usually a reason, um, or how you ended up there. So I would get caught in these like conversations and I'd be like, okay, here we go. The cliff notes version. But, um, more or less, I was married for almost two years, found out my husband was having an affair with a 19 year old for six months filed for divorce, left shortly after that, met a guy, fell madly in love with each other and had this whirlwind romance. And he convinced me to go on a month long trip to Italy with him. 48 hours before we were getting on the plane, he told me he needed to go by himself and broke up with me. And I was absolutely devastated, like broke my heart like my ex-husband never could have done. Um, and I was like, well, I can either stay at home heartbroken or I can go travel Europe for a month by myself. So I took a backpack and I did six countries over the span of a month and wrote Eat, Pray, FML about it. Obviously, I would say on the trip talking to travelers, I'd say, and I'm writing a book about it. If you hang out with me long enough, you might be in it. Um, but yeah, it, that was the uh, the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> oh, man. What was your favorite like in, in writing that book? like, what was your favorite part? Like, obviously it was a hard, hard piece to write, but what was your, I, you know, what was your favorite part in that trip? 
Oh God. I think each country I went to brought something different. Um, I really loved taking the trains. Um, like I remember I took the train from Paris to Barcelona and it was like a six hour train ride. And I just sat and wrote chapter after chapter. Um, and I was writing all of this like by hand in my leather journal. So it was really therapeutic to be going through something so heavy and having the thoughts in your head literally come out of your hand onto the paper. Um, there's a very spiritual kind of like letting go in that. I think that's why people journal. Um, so that was really special to be able to experience healing in that specific way. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think if, if we're talking about like favorite place that I ended up on that trip, Barcelona just totally yeah. took my heart and the people that I met there really were a big part of that as well. Mm. Yeah. I, um, I'm trying to think of places to go with my wife. Um, and just listening to your trip, like what I love is that you really dive into like each individual culture and, and, and country and talk about your experiences there with the food and the people. And I really loved it. Um, I heard New Zealand is like off the charts. I've never been there, but I just, I've heard great things about it. So I went to New Zealand when I was six years old. Um, I obviously don't, can't speak on it from an adult perspective, <laughs> but I have very fond memories of it. Um, even though it was kind of a tumultuous time um, in my family's life, my mom was filming uh, a movie called The Frighteners directed by Peter Jackson who of course did like all the Lord of the Rings and King mm -hmm. Kong. Um, and we were over there to be with her for filming her and my nanny and myself. Um, and then we came back. And when we came back, my mom was still in New Zealand shooting. That was when my father passed from a heart attack. Um, and it was pretty traumatic. I walked in to like wake him up for morning cartoons and found him on the floor in the bathroom. Jeez. Um, my mom had to fly home the next day, um, kind of like got all the affairs in order. And then we had his celebration of life, got back on a plane and flew back to New Zealand for her to finish the movie. Um, I think that was my first kind of example of how to be a badass and handle shit when life explodes in mm -hmm. front of you. <laughs> um, and, but still even through all that New Zealand, was such a memorable experience even at such a young age like i remember how beautiful it was how kind the people were i do think it's not the cheapest um i could be completely inaccurate on that but i do feel like i've heard that um if you're looking for somewhere to go where you can kind of like ball out on a budget and have a really authentic experience thailand was like yeah my funny enough i went there in college uh oh really a, a month yeah, a month with my buddy. He he came in uh, for an exchange student my senior year and kind of lived with us. And then his family, you know, they, they're very appreciative and, and grateful. And they're like, we'll pay for you to come over here. So I went over there for like a month, oh, like cool. with like, <laughs> with like $150 in my pocket. <laughs> like, it was like one of those, I, I, I can't believe I did that. I was 20 yeah. years old. I was in college. Like, I, you know, I wasn't able to drink legally here. But uh, went over there for like a month, like seriously with 150 bucks in my pocket. They took care of everything. And I still can't believe I did it. It was like a 24 hour flight. Yeah, um, we, it's brutal. We, it's a brutal flight. Yeah. Although New Zealand is too. New Zealand's a long ass plane ride. <laughs> um, but you're married now, right? Like I think I saw on Instagram, you were like in Hawaii with your husband now and hanging out I'm and having in, a good time. I, I'm, in, I'm engaged. We got engaged uh, in June recently uh, mm -hmm. in Europe. So we took a two week trip to Italy and he proposed there, which was very full circle because that's where my journey was supposed to start when I took my Europe trip initially. Um, so all, for all of my readers, when we shared it online, it was very like they felt, I felt like they were celebrating with me and it was, it was very That's, cool. It's not Javier, is it? Oh my God. No, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I don't mean, know. You'd, you'd have to, you'll, you'd have to read the sequel to, you know, get the details on who it is, but, um, but no, it's not Javier. <laughs> it's Javier <laughs> invited ask, to the people wedding. People ask that all the, oh my God, no big no. <laughs> but again, you would, if, when you, if you read the sequel, you'll, you'll kind of see how, uh, how that relationship plays out and you meet who I end up with, although it was not an easy journey to get to where we're at now. 
Um, but I don't think if we wouldn't have gone through all the things we did, we wouldn't be as strong as we are now. But I think that's why the second book was a lot harder for me to write because there's things in the sequel that I'm not necessarily proud of. Um, and there's nothing in Eat, Pray, Eat, Pray, FML that I'm ashamed about. Like, I, I mean, I guess maybe the one night stand, but like, not really, like we've all done that and like learned a lesson from it. Um, but there's things in the sequel where I'm like, Ooh, this is not fun to, to open up and write about. And I, I had a, a partner to now protect his feelings. And although he knew everything I was writing about, it's different when you have to sit down and read that. Um, but I still had to be authentic and honest and, and include everything for, you know, to do myself justice and my readers. Sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's, it's gotta be like, I'm just thinking from a standpoint of, uh, a spouse, right? Like your, your boy loves you to death, right. And, and supporting you and, and like having to, you know, cause I know, you know, with my wife and I, like, you know, I'm just getting to the point now where it's like, um, you know, we're having those conversations and I don't have that, you know, we've been married 10, 11 years. And like, you know, sometimes it's like you have those program responses to things like she might say something about an ex-boyfriend or something i'm like huh and then mm -hmm. like for you to have your you know you guys My are getting married. Career. <laughs> yeah. well you have that story right and so yeah. like to your point it's very intimate and it's very honest and it's very raw and then for him to be so he, ha he has to be super secure in who he is and who your what your relationship is you know the foundation of that has to be super strong for someone to be able to read that and like you know what i mean like it's tough yeah i, I think there's maybe five percent of the population who could be in a relationship and a have their journey and story written about in a very public way and b be so not okay which he is but also so incredibly supportive of your partner when literally they talk about their exes five days a week like it's my job i'm always on podcasts i'm always doing interviews i'm always answering questions like it's constant um and i he came on a couple episodes of my podcast and we of course got that question like how does he deal with that and he was like it it pales in comparison when i see how many people she's helping with her books mm. like it makes all of it feel so much bigger than an ex um and you know like they're different if if i was just talking about my ex-husband like it wouldn't be that big of a thing the guy after uh javier that one's a little closer to home um which people will read about in the sequel why why that is um but yeah i mean we've we've gone to therapy which i'm an advocate of and think everyone should do uh it's it's helped us tremendously just talk through things and be able to make sure our foundation is strong and that each other is the most important. Um, but he's, he's also, you know, in the top two percentile of men on the planet. So it's, I also just got lucky in that sense. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about self-love, right. And, um, some of the stuff that you were doing, like giving your power away, in the way that you were kind of dealing with a lot of the, the trauma in your life. Um, you talk about that, which I thought was fascinating. You, you uncovered that through a, a process called the thought onion, which, mm -hmm. you know, as a psych student myself, like going back to school, like I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I get asked all the time what therapist I picked that up from. I'm like, no, I came up with that on the streets of London. Although I'm sure there's other people that use that process and call it something different, but <laughs> What's the latest thought on you that you've unraveled? Oh God, way to put me on the spot, but with also such a great <laughs> fucking question. Um, well, okay. Ooh. Um, we recently were just in Hawaii. Um, his uh, daughter from his first marriage lives out there with her mom. We all have a really great relationship. Like it's probably the easiest co-parenting triangle on the planet. Um, and I adore his daughter. However, when I came into their life, she was five years old, turning six. Hmm. And that's the age I was when I lost my dad. Oh. And so it was very like, you know, 
the universe orchestrates that shit for us to heal, right? Like it's not just coincidence. Um, Tay, my fiance also has a lot of qualities that my dad has. Um, even my mom has been like their, their energy is similar. Um, he's older than I am. Like there's a lot of things that just like play into the trauma of me losing my father. Um, and we were in Hawaii recently and his daughter was like begging him to sleep with her that night. And normally it's like not a big deal. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like go cuddle, whatever, like I'll starfish on the bed. But I must have been in some type of mood or some type of feels. Hawaii always has like a way that like it brings stuff to the surface. And I had a weird reaction to it and was like, you know, for lack of better terms, like, fuck this chick, dude. Can like you just come snuggle with me? I'm sad. I want like some love tonight. And I stopped myself. I was like, whoa, what's going on here? Like there's something deeper. So for people that are listening, the thought onion is really like a way that you can look at your thoughts and your reactions that you're having and take a step back and kind of dissect them in a step-by-step -step way so that you can get to what's at the root and what's causing them so you can then have different reactions or thoughts in the future. Um, so for example, when you have your initial thought or reaction, that's called the superficial thought. And that's like your knee jerk, like in the moment, how you decide to react or don't decide how it comes out. And under that is the authentic thought. And that's kind of like, what's the emotion that I'm feeling inside of me that caused that thought in the first place? And the subconscious thought, which is like the third layer, that's usually a long stemming trauma or a subconscious belief, something that's been with you for a long time, that if you can get to that layer, you can be aware of it and adjust it and heal it in order to change your thoughts or your reactions in the future. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, let's thought onion this bitch. Um, <laughs> and the initial, obviously superficial thought was like, why the fuck can't she like leave her dad alone and let him come sleep with me? Like he should be sleeping with me anyways. She's 10. This is silly. Um, the authentic thought would be, I feel like I'm not chosen. Like that was the feeling inside that caused that initial thought. And the subconscious thought was dad's leaving me. Oh. Obviously, like he's not my father. I'm fucking aware of this. Like it's not a creepy relationship like that. But the seven-year-old little girl in me who very much still exists, like people talk about inner child work all the time. It's so important if you haven't healed certain parts of you there's a little girl or boy inside of there kicking and screaming being like yo bitch like uh uh, pay attention to me and that little seven-year-old was going dad's leaving and abandoning me again which oh. of course like is so not what was happening on a surface level but then i was able to understand why i was having that reaction and for me all i did was like take a moment i, I probably put some some calming music on and went in, in my mind's eye, went in to talk to my seven-year-old little girl and say, Hey, Gabrielle, like, I, I just want you to know that everything's okay. You're not abandoned. Even if, you know, dad did leave, whether he chose to or not, like, I'm always going to be here for you. You're always safe. You're always protected. Um, and really like have a conversation with your inner child. That's one of the biggest tools my mom as a healer has taught me um, that's really helped me address some of the uh, the trauma that has been with me from that age. Mm. I love that. Yeah, I've done that a couple of times and it, like, it is, it is very powerful. Like I see l the little boy that was me, right? And like hugging him and saying that he's worthy yeah. and that he's enough and like, you know, because like I have, I do have um, issues with like, trying to go above and beyond to prove my worth right and when mm -hmm. you have that self-love conversation like as long as you like you meant you mentioned it at the end of your book about really loving yourself and and valuing um that version of yourself you talk about the love cocktail yeah. and how we can love ourselves every day and that i wasn't doing that for the longest time like i would mm -hmm. i would just superficially go out into the world and just try to be the best version that I could possibly be for them, not for me. And Ooh, yeah. it was very empty, right? Like, I mean, we do that every day in our lives when we try to show up and, you know, be superficial about our feelings and not being authentic with how we feel with others and communicating that, yeah. um, dive deep, go inside, talk to that child. Cause a lot of it is 
you know, the child work or whatever you want to call it. It's the small child inside of us, like begging for attention and totally, you know, totally. like to your point. And- And for people that, you know, listen and like, maybe you're like, oh, that's a little too woo woo for me. Like if you're not making enough money, like look at what your little child saw growing up. Did, you know, not enough money equal mom and dad were never there because they were trying to work all the time. Like there's, there's always going to be a reason for blocks and walls that you're hitting in your life. So for me, like I had a fear of abandonment since my dad died. Um, not that like he chose to die and abandon me, but when you're seven and you're like, oh, dad died, the people I love die, fear of abandonment. I then, um, my high school sweetheart when I was 18 died in a car crash. So that was like that same wound being ripped wide open and fear of abandonment. So I was walking around the world with this fear of abandonment, attracting people into my life that were going to show me that belief that I had. So I could then look at it and be like, oh, I need to fix that. So what did I do? I attracted my husband who abandoned me in the most heinous way possible by cheating on me. And the universe was like, okay, Gabrielle, are we ready to, uh, we ready to look at this and heal this? I was like, no, no, I'm good. Thanks. Um, and then I attracted a man into my life who quite literally, like in an almost laughable, ironic way, abandoned me 48 hours before we were getting on a flight. And the universe was like, okay, are we ready now to go heal this? And I'm like, all right, I guess we'll go try. Um, (laughs) And in fixing that abandonment belief and that fear of abandonment, only then was I able to attract someone like my current partner who would never abandon me in that way um, because I no longer had that belief. So when there's patterns of things happening to you, Um, like I get messages all the time, uh, from people saying I, every relationship I get into, I get cheated on, or I keep getting broken up with, or I can't get this job. I get to the last person and then they pick the other, the other candidate. Um, those are all things that feel very unfair and feel like, why is this happening to me? And that don't seem like they're your fault. And I'm not saying like you're a bad person, but I'm saying like when there's patterns in your life. Point the finger back at yourself because there is an unconscious belief that you need to fix. And once that is cleared, a lot of shit will start opening up for you. Mm -hmm. How did you realize that? Right. I know your mom's a healer. Uh, I've listened to a lot of your uh, mom's like interviews with different people. Um, And she seems, you know, you talk about the universe consciousness um, going inside. Like, did she help you develop that in you? Oh, hugely. Um, so my, for people listening, my mom is Dee Wallace. She's an actress. She was the mom in E.T., Cujo, The Howling. Um, my dad was also an actor when he was alive and a director as well. And he was actually the one that first, this was like back in the day, obviously, brought her the secret and was like, you know, all into manifesting and spirituality. Um, like my mom always tells the story that my dad would see a breakdown for a role and it would be like, a short, fat woman. Um, and he'd be like, no, I love this role. I'm going to make this my role. And he would end up like convincing the casting directors that like, obviously it should be written for him. (laughs) Um, like really into the manifesting stuff. Um, but it wasn't until my dad passed, it was a couple months after that my mom, um, and this is like me telling her story, obviously, uh, was in their bathroom and like, in a moment of grief, like dropped down to her knees and was like, I need to figure out a way to not feel this anymore. I need to learn how to my, how to heal myself. And she got a message in her, like she, she heard a voice and this is sounding so woo woo guys stay with me. Um, she heard a message and since then she started becoming a healer, diving into her healing work. She's a clear audience channel. So she hears messages um, and tests with like a pendulum and is able to clear subconscious blocks and really get to insane stuff that, you know, would take years and years of therapy within 30 minutes. So I've grown up with her developing this work. Um, It's a blessing 99% of the time. There is the time where I'm like, I just want to call and complain, mom, like stop (laughs) telling me how to fix my life and what I need to heal. Um, But it's life-changing work that has really guided me in my life. Um, I've seen it change so many of her clients' lives. I've seen it 
in real time changed my life. Um, and it really has created like my grounding in spirituality for sure. Mm. Do you like, so you keep saying woohoo, right? And I love woohoo, right? And <laughs> do you like, do you, do you bump up against that resistance? Like when you're promoting like your book and you're getting like some of the, the markets that aren't necessarily open to that kind of stuff, do you feel kind of awkward or do you feel kind of like, um, you have to tiptoe a little bit? Um, I don't know. Not with the book. I mean, there's, I I don't think there's anything in the book that people are like, whoa, this is really out there. Um, I actually took a chapter out of the sequel because I did fear that. Um, and I ended up releasing that chapter on my Patreon um, subscription one season. And everyone was like, why did you take this out of the book? This is fucking awesome. And it was basically where I went to a a uh, healer and did a past life regression. Mm. And in that past life regression, um, it was me and Javier and I was his mother. Oh. Um, and it was like, and obviously like breaking a mother son bond is really intense. Um, if you've had a past life with someone in any capacity, if you've had a past life with someone, um, but it started to make so much sense why I couldn't just like get over this breakup that, mm -hmm. you know, was not even that long of a relationship. Um, so I don't know if there's anything in the first book where I feel like, ooh, are people going to hang with me through this in the woo-woo sense? Um, I mean, I'm very woo-woo in my life. Like I, my whole podcast, I talk about like manifesting and creating what you want and owning, you know, your spirituality and stuff. But I don't know if apart from that one chapter that I did take out, I don't know if there's anything that I feel I bump up against necessarily. Well, yeah, the book isn't really like there's a couple of, like meditations and things like that, but there's nothing really like to your yeah. point, woohoo. I mean, like when you're talking or something like that, and um, like there are mentions about your mom being a healer, and I guess they kind of, I don't know, I feel like th this manifesting is like kind of getting mainstream now. Mm -hmm. But as far as like consciousness and the universe, and um, you know, you're, you're actually creating this for yourself, right? Like everything that you're experiencing, there's something inside of you, like to your point that the subconscious yeah. is projecting into your reality um like i'm causing everything right like you eat like the good stuff and the bad stuff and some people don't want to own that they want to they want to think that something's happening to them right like yeah. the universe is doing this to me and i'm not doing it to myself yeah. um so yeah i just um i feel like the, the woohoo stuff is just like old stuff that is like everybody's just coming on to now like i feel like this right. has been like taught remembering for like, yeah yeah, yeah, remembering. Starting to wake up too. <laughs> Remember, that's a great, that's a great analogy. Like remembering, like that's a hundred percent because um the past life regression stuff, like I I just got turned on to like Dolores Cannon like three months mm -hmm. ago. And like I'm like, oh my God, like I'm reading all of her books and um I, I'm just yeah, my like, mom yeah. worked with her a lot. Yeah, she's actually on one of the episodes that I listened to. Um, oh, but, nice. but it's funny though, cause we were talking about synchronicities, uh, which is what I've been experiencing with just reading your book. Like you, you talked about in the book that you were, you're, you were reading the alchemist and the four agreements. And I lit literally had those two books on my desk right now. And, uh, I was driving today, listening to the very end of your audible book. And I'm like thinking to myself, like, I would be so interested in learning about a past life with her and just seeing where mm. she came from. And then you just mentioned that. And I'm like, Oh, I love that. I'm kind of, I'm kind of having like a moment right now. I'm just like, you yeah. put it, you put it out to the, the universe and it delivers. I love that. So I just had this woman on my podcast. It hasn't aired yet and won't for a couple months, but she basically does soul readings. Um, so she'll look at your name and each letter in your name has like a uh, a number and then she'll read a whole chart based off of that and I brought her on and we start like getting into all of the you know what happens before we get to this life and we were talking about this analogy which I absolutely love that it's like everybody's up in you know whatever heaven universe whatever you want to call it we're all up there hanging out and getting ready to come down and a bus pulls up and it's like, oh, this is my bus. I'm ready. I'm going. I'm going down, guys, everybody. And you're like, okay, I need a person that's going to absolutely break my fucking heart and make me go on this crazy journey. Who wants to volunteer to do that? And some soul up there is like, I love you enough to be that villain in your story. Like, I'll go and I'll do that for you. <laughs> and he gets on the bus. And someone else is like, okay, I need someone that's going to teach me this, this, and this. And they're like, ooh, I'll, I'll be that person. And they get on the bus. And- 
I think there's a lot of toxic positivity out there when people are like, everything happens for a reason. It's going to be fine. I so wholeheartedly believe everything happens for a reason. Like I'm a walking fucking example of that, but not in the just brush it off and always be happy way. But in the, if you can look at things in that analogy, like the people that fuck you over in life are really here to teach you some giant lesson and it's going to change you as a person and make you a better person. Even if you can't see that reason in the moment and in the hurt of it, knowing that it will eventually become clear to you in that way gives you so much peace dealing with things on a day to day mm. in, in my opinion. Sure. It's like when you're pulled into that though, you can't see it. Like when you're all into the feels, like when you're in, oh, you, know, yeah. you no. just can't it, it see takes, it. It takes a while. Um, but for <laughs> your, the comment about, um, little signs and synchronicities, she was like, you know, when someone's here on a soul contract to like help you in a certain way in your life, the universe will sprinkle in signs that like you can't fucking ignore. So like sure. in, in my example, when I met Javier, he was like, yeah, I'm going on this Europe trip. You have to come with me. And I was like, you're fucking crazy. When are you leaving? And he was like, September 4th, which would have been my two-year wedding anniversary. And I'm like, okay, when are you coming home? And he says, October 4th, which is my late father's birthday. So that was all I needed. And I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to Europe. The universe <laughs> is like, bitch, get on the plane. <laughs> so like, it was things like that. And she's like, those are things that are predetermined that are going to ensure that you follow the path that you're supposed to be on. Sure. And I thought that was really cool. No, that is cool. Cause I was struggling a little, cause I just got back from LA probably a month ago and I didn't know why I was out there. Right. Like, um, I had an opportunity to, to participate in some healing energy and energy work. And it's totally outside my, my comfort zone. Right. Like I'm my wife, she's, you know, anything longer than two hours on a flight. She's like, I'm not doing it. Right. <laughs> everything, everything aligned for us to go. Like, I mean, I was seeing signs. I was seeing, you know, um, like the white rabbit from, um, the matrix, right. The comment about follow the white rabbit, like that had come up in the conversation with the person that I went out there to go see. And like every day after that, I saw a white rabbit somewhere, right. Like, it wasn't even Easter time. And I was just seeing a white rabbit. And, um, they had mentioned that they had done some work with a, um, a particular college and I would see that college everywhere. I would see license plates like ca California license plates. I'm in, I'm in Baltimore. Like I, I counted one day I saw like six and it oh, was wow. like, like, what is going on right now? I, I, I guess I'm supposed to go. So I go out there and I do the healing LA's like amazing. Um, I think, um, it's the first time out on the West coast. We stayed in Santa Monica. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, that's a great place to experience the West coast <laughs> for the first time. Yeah. I went to Venice, went to Manhattan beach. Uh, we saw, um, Hollywood went down to Beverly Hills and, and just did the tour stuff mm -hmm. and, uh, kind of, you know, wasn't really feeling the vibe of, you know, of the healing and stuff. Didn't know what, where that was taking me, did that. I'm thinking like, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, all right, I'm out there on Santa Monica pier with my wife. I'm like, all right, God or universe. <laughs> like I'm here. <laughs> Like what's Show me next? Why. <laughs> part the sea. Come on, man. And, uh, no, I got a, a couple of really cool uh, sunsets and, um, I had a great conversation with, um, Julia Cannon, um, the next day at the hotel, like we had set up a call to kind of talk about her coming on the show and hanging out and talking about past life regressions. But after that, it's just kind of like, I don't know. And maybe the universe is just, that was like kind of seeing like what I'm willing to follow, you know, like, mm. what am I, what am I going to do out here? Um, you know, or maybe, maybe the, the fruits of whatever was planted in LA aren't here yet. You know, sure, sure. I think sometimes we get so caught up on like that instant gratification that to me, like looking back on some things that I've been working on manifesting or things that like I've been pulled to do, um, I forget about. And then months down the road, I'm like, Oh shit. Like this was because of that and wouldn't have happened if I didn't do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. The instant gratification gets us like we want everything right now, you know? Well, sure. We're like, I'm flying to LA. Fucking heal me. Fix my heal life. me. Heal me. <laughs> Fix my life. Show me the sign. Come on. Hook me up with something. Come on. And you get back and it's just like, Oh, oh you know, nothing's changed. Yeah. Here you go. Here's some more stress and anxiety in your life. <laughs>
Yeah, um, I know that all too well. I know, right? But it's just, it's, uh, I guess the frustration is just, you know, we get so caught up in our shit, you know, and, and we have to, you know, for me, it's just, you know, as you awaken to the universe, as the, as the universe, you know, awakens you a little bit, it's kind of like, you want to, you want to see what else is out there. There's a curiosity. It's like, well, shit, if I'm seeing this and I can do this, if I can manifest this trip, like what else can I do? You know, like what else can we do as human beings, as consciousness, yeah. as, as part of the, the source, you know? Totally. I think people that are interested in, you know, working on manifesting things, the biggest lesson I've learned in it is that you have to put your order in and decide very specifically what you want and like do whatever, you know, meditating or magnetizing or whatever exercises you're going to do. And then to some extent, let it go, which is the hardest part because it's usually stuff that you want so fucking bad <laughs> and not be um, married to the way that it shows up. So for example, when I released Eat, Pray, FML, I can't even tell you, probably for like three or four months, every night I went to bed and was like working on, okay, a celebrity is going to read this book. They're going to post about it on Instagram and then it's just going to take off like wildfire. Like that was how it was obviously going to happen in my brain. Never in a million years, if someone was like, actually, no, you're going to get on this like child's app called TikTok and it's going to blow up and you're going to do it by videos that you make. I would have been like, what? No, sure shit, you know? So like putting in what you want and then not being attached to the way it shows up. Um, I mean, I've been working on recently manifesting something super big that's just coming to fruition to the point where like it's so new, I can't even talk about it yet. Um, but I uh. had a very, sp I know, sorry to leave you hanging on that, um, very specific way that I thought it was going to go. Um, I had it like with the best people, like it, it was all set for like, you know, this is the path that it should take. And lo and behold, I got a DM on Instagram from someone that saw my TikTok and that is the whole way that it started, you know, like. So, so visualization, feeling the emotion and then yeah. letting it go. My biggest thing is like going to your love place. So like that can be your dog or your kid or like whatever, like really makes your heart happy and feel good on the inside. And you go to that place and kind of like daydream about what it would be like to be in that moment. So as if it's already here, as if it's already happened, as if you're like, you know, accepting the award for what you're trying to create. Um, really like being in the present. I've also been doing an exercise that like I've seen wild results from where you go to that love place and you visualize like magnetizing the people um, that you would need to help you get there into your energy field. So you're like drawing in, you know, let's say if like you're in the business and you're like, I'm attracting all the directors and casting directors that are really going to like see my authenticity and want to work with me um, and attracting all of those people into your energy. That's been a really powerful tool for me lately. Hmm. Any, any individual that you attracted that you were like, holy shit, like this really does work. Oh yeah. Like the biggest of the big that I needed for this specific. I'll, I'll tell you about it when we stop recording. When, when we stop, um, <laughs> yes, when I hit stop. Yes, um, but yeah, I mean, it. it's it, it the work when you can believe in it and do it and then let go and not be so like chokehold on the outcome can be really powerful. Mm -hmm. Wow. Do you teach that? Do, like, I, I know you have a Patreon. Do you do, do any of that with that? Uh, no, I mean, I talk about this off and on on the podcast. Um, we've definitely like touched on this stuff before. Um, on the Patreon, I do like mini bonus episode seasons and there's one season that's all on healing. Um, and there's a lot of this in that. Um, but no, there's nowhere where I like specifically teach this. I think maybe because so much of it feels like I've gotten it from my mom. So I'm like, am I just like teaching her shit at this point? <laughs> but like, she's like, Look, you connect with a whole different audience that is going to hear everything in a totally different way. She's like, so spread the word. <laughs> do you have the same, like, do you feel like you have the same ability? Well, I, I personally believe that we all have those types of abilities. Like your mom, are you like opening up to that more for yourself? 
Um, it's so funny you ask that because she asks me all the time, like why I don't want to kind of like expand into the work more. Like I know how to work with a pendulum and I, I feel like what she calls messages, I'm more comfortable calling my intuition and guesses. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have been told by a few, you know, psychic and mediums that like, I, I'm going to kind of go into that at some point in my life. Um, but I'm not pulled to it right now. Like sure. my, my way of helping people right now is like, you know, with the books and the lessons in there and the podcast and more of like a, this world helping. Um, but maybe one day that'll change. I don't know. Sure. Um, the psychic that you had in your book, she was spot on, man. She was, uh, if I could tell you how many messages a week I get saying, okay, everything's happened except the daughter at 33. When do you think that's coming? Mur, mur, mur. I'm like, <laughs> guys. So yeah, she basically predicted my entire life. Um, and at the time, um, I was still married, but like kind of, kind of finding out about some shady stuff and was like thinking maybe, um, maybe I might be getting divorced, but hadn't found all the big stuff out. And, um, she kept saying in that session, she's like, I need you writing. I really need you writing. And at the time I was just acting and directing. I'm like, I don't have any fucking ideas for a film script. <laughs> like, all right, dude. But like, okay. And it was like laughable when I re realized like, oh, I'm going to write the book. <laughs> um, and she did say, I had her on my podcast in the first season. And I was like, you know, sometimes mediums get messages um, or see visions that they explain one way, but then it later makes sense in a different way. Like my mm. mom and dad went to a psychic one time and my the the woman was like, I don't know how to say this, but like I, I see you having an affair in front of like in front of your husband. And my mom was like, Well, that's never gonna happen. What are you talking about? And a year later she was on stage doing Annie Get Your Gun, acting out a scene where she was having an affair and my dad was sitting in the front row. Wow. Um so I brought that story up to her and I was like, Do you think maybe you saw me having my fiance's daughter, um, like as, as like my stepkid. Um, and she was like, yeah, sure. If you, if you want to, if that makes you feel better, I was like, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> so I'm 34 in November. I don't think we're going to make the cutoff, but, uh, but yeah, I, she was wildly accurate about like everything else. Sure. Well, time's so weird. Like if you take it out of this reality, right? Like totally, it's not even, not even a thing outside of, you know, this physical reality it's like time is not nothing right like every, every time you experience like flow states or anything you know in deep meditation there is no time associated with it so it's interesting how like when psychics say things like i've had some really great psychics say some things to me um i try not to i'd say don't give me a timeline because i don't you know i don't want one i don't want to stress about it and i don't want to like doubt it so just yeah just don't do that because sometimes it's hard like i mean time is a, a man created tool. And, um, you know, we put so much, so much emphasis on it. Like I know I do with goals and oh, short term, yeah. long term, like it's, and then we're, we're doing exactly what we're not supposed to do, which is letting go and mm -hmm. letting it come. We're then we're like, okay, is it, is it October yet? She said October. And it's like, no, no, no. Like you've got to chill and just let go. I've actually, the good mediums that I have had sessions with have, have always said, I, this is what I'm seeing, but time is like not linear. So like this could be, I'm seeing the number three, it could be three days or three years, you know, like it, it's very up in the air time-wise. That'd be interesting though, to see you like come out, like build this foundation with your fan base and then come out and start toying and developing those psychic skills maybe, or like intu intuition and like turn, turn it into something totally different. Yeah. That'd be interesting. And you you know, I'm open to wherever the, uh, the roads are going to lead, um, from what has been built thus far. And I think that anytime I've been super, just like, okay, I'm open wherever the wind blows me, it, uh, it takes me somewhere really good. So I try and consistently live like that. Although it's very hard. I'm a fucking insane control freak. And I always like, I'm so impatient. I'm just like, let's go. What are we doing next? <laughs> <laughs> Gabrielle, this has been amazing. Like I just, you know, I keep going all night. Um, Thank you for taking the time. Like this really means a lot that you, you would take the time out of your schedule to come hang out with me on the show. Thanks, dude. And thank you for taking the time to read the book. Um, it's always such a better conversation when someone has, and I know everybody's really busy and doesn't necessarily have time to do that. 
Um, and I love when, when guys go on that journey with me. So thank you. I, I really appreciate it. I can never look at you the same. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully in a good way. <laughs> yeah. Right. How many words is that? Is the book. How many words is what? The book. Oh God. I don't know off the top of my head. I know it's 280 pages. The first one. It's like, it's like nine hours on audible. And I'm just thinking yeah. like you, you hand wrote that, that that's insane. I did. I did. There were two chapters, like my, the divorce chapters, um, which I wasn't even originally planning on including. I was just going to be like, so my husband cheated. I got divorced. Then all this shit happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and my girlfriends were like, no, 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 no. Like that was like an episode of CSI. You have to write about that. So that I wrote when I was back in LA, um, and typed, but the rest of it was written by hand. Sure. So how well, can people, journal. <laughs> <laughs> what's your website? Where can people find you? Uh, it's eatprayfml.com. And we have all the uh, merch for the podcast and signed books. Uh, you can also get them on Amazon or Audible. The first is Eat, Pray, FML. And the second is The Ridiculous Misadventures of a Single Girl. Um, and I also have a self-love healing journal that's called Fuck Off, I'm Healing. And it's kind of like a step-by-step -step guide to help you work through trauma and bullshit that you've gone through in your life and uh, come out the other end. Mm. Eat, pray, fuck my life. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. This has been amazing. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me.